Hello, good evening, welcome, welcome, welcome. Do let me know in the chat whether you can hear the playback of the music and also if you can hear my voice. That would be helpful. We'll be starting up in just a minute. You can hear both, that's great. All right, let's, uh, let's get the show on the road. From a slightly different angle today experimenting in lots of different ways welcome you're so very welcome to this the beginning of computer music week oh yes i'm grabbing the computer by the throat and i'm throttling it into submission to attempt to put forward a week of i don't know demonstrations seminars maybe interviews interesting things to do with computer-based music making exactly what it is I'm not entirely sure yet I've had a very busy week <laughs> so uh, I haven't had anywhere near as much you know, dedicated preparation time as perhaps I would like but you know how these things are we just like to throw ourselves in and see what happens so the, the plan for the week if you're not aware is that uh, this week as I say there'll be seminars and interviews tomorrow night I'm talking to Pete Brown from Microsoft he's our man at Microsoft. We actually have a person at Microsoft, which is which is quite alarming and interesting. I'm just going to move this light a little bit because it's a bit shining off my head. <laughs> so yes, tomorrow night um, I'm talking to uh, Pete Brown from Microsoft. He is someone who works in the development team on the uh, audio side of things, on Wasapi drivers, on how the whole audio side of Windows operates. So hopefully he'll be able to offer some really interesting insight to how that works, what Windows is all about, what Microsoft are doing, how we can make it work better, what we should be looking out for, that sort of stuff. I think it will just be interesting. What I hope it isn't is just an opportunity going, why doesn't Windows do this? That's not really what we're after. We're kind of after getting underneath the surface of Windows and finding out interesting, interesting things that are going to help us in our music making. Uh, then on another night next week, I'm talking to uh, a guy from Personas all about Studio One and also about their hardware. Sort of a general talking about doors, talking about how that connectivity works, controllers, all that sort of thing. That's going to be happening, I think, on Tuesday. I might have that wrong. I don't know. I don't have my pamphlet to hand. And then on uh, Wednesday night I was hoping to have someone from Bitwig along but unfortunately they, they can't make it so I'm going to do a an evening session on Bitwig and how to connect it to things like modular synths and other external hardware so generally having a look into the grid inside Bit, Bitwig see how that functions as a modular environment in software and how that can spill out into hardware so that's Wednesday night I think Thursday night, no, not Thursday night, Thursday daytime, I'm going to do an interview with Myla Melodies. Yes, I am. He's coming along because, yeah, we like work during the day. It seemed like let's do it as a work thing. So it'll be like four o'clock in the afternoon. Um, we're going to sit down and talk about the merits of software and the merits of hardware and how the two intermingle and how those sorts of things play out. So that's going to be interesting. Hardware, software, because hardware is so hot right now. And so it would be interesting just to contrast those things. Then on Friday night, I'm going to sit down and talk about Windows tweaking. How do we make Windows work best for audio and music making? 
that is going to be Friday night. It's going to be a bit of a discussion. It will be mostly me going, no, 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 you don't need to do. No, no, don't do that. <laughs> but do do this. So that'll be Friday night. That's cool. After that, who knows? I mean, by the time it comes around to this time next week, it will be Molten Music Monthly time again. So we might well have a live stream next Sunday night just to finish off and talk about it and to do the usual sort of talking of news and stuff, which I will not get distracted by this evening. If you're here for the first time, you're very, very welcome. Um, my name's Robin Vincent. This is Molten Music Technology. I do all sorts of things, but mostly in the content side of things, I talk about synthesis, I talk about software, I talk about hardware. Don't get distracted by all this kind of paraphernalia over here. We're not interested in that tonight. We're gonna focus in the box on the software. And so what I hope to achieve this evening is very simply unpack the concepts around making music on a computer, what that means. I mean, really basic stuff. So if you're here with not much of a clue, this is exactly where you need to be because I'm going to be talking about the clueless stuff, yeah? Uh, in order to get us to some kind of position where we understand how a computer can help us with our music making because there's lots of different ways that can happen. And so that's what we we'll are doing this evening. That means talking about software, it means talking about audio interfaces, it talks about MIDI keyboards and, and all, that, all that kind of jazz. To make this work, I've sort of got an overhead camera, right, on, on my Surface here. I'm running everything just on the, the Surface Pro and hopefully that'll be all right. I mean, there's lots of finger marks and stuff. My hands are gonna get in the way. But hey, hey, that seems to be the best way to do it. I did try sort of capturing the desktop and sticking that into the, it's just got too complicated. And that's the last thing you need. Rule number one, don't make it too complicated when it comes to doing stuff on computers. So this is the plan. This is the plan. So this evening, an introduction to making music on your computer. So talk amongst yourselves for a minute. I just need to clean my glasses because I can't see anything. And uh, what? <laughs> and I, I will dip into the comments from time to time just because it's, it amuses me as much as anything else. But at the end, after I've, I, I'm gonna sort of try to present something, I'll kind of pre present some stuff. And at the end of that, then let's talk about it. And you can ask questions and I can answer questions because there's always, everyone's got their own scenario. You know what I mean? I mean, for every person, there's probably like a thousand people, <laughs> thousand people. There's probably like 12 people sitting there going, I want to know all about recording my guitar. And then there's 20 people going, oh, I just want to make beats. And another 15 people going, well, I want to make beats and guitars. Or somebody else just wants to play with synths. Everyone has their own scenario. And so I'll happily answer questions on all those sorts of things. Uh, my credentials, if you don't know, I've built computers for, um, for studios and for making music on for about 25 years. So there you go, that's my credentials. I don't do it as a day job anymore. I did used to, um, but not so much now. Uh, I've moved on to, to writing about things, making videos about things and that kind of thing. So uh, I'm not in it in the day to day quite like I was, except for my own music making. But by the by, we should probably get started. Oh no, I was having a look in the comments, wasn't I? Yes, hi everyone, Andrew, hi, Andre, good to see you, Steve, great. Sinister, lovely to see you, Paul, great, good to see you. Uh, also, if you're new to my channel, the chat just kind of does its own thing. Don't worry about it too much. It's nice, there are a nice bunch of people talking about all sorts of stuff, sometimes it's relevant, sometimes it isn't. Don't worry, if you wanna ask a question, just get in there. I can't promise to answer or see every single question, but I'll, you know, I'll do my best, and if I miss something, keep asking. Right, so we should start. We should start. How should we start? That's the question. Well, there are two concepts within computer music that are very important to understand and to contrast because they get bundled up and muddled up and put into each other and misunderstood. Those two things are MIDI and audio. MIDI and audio. 
MIDI is a computer language. It's a protocol. It's a form of data exchange between musical electronic instruments and devices. Audio is sound that we can hear with our ears. Now I know you're sitting there going, oh, this is right. You know, what well, is this easy stuff? Yeah, no, I know. But bear with me because these sorts of things are important. Now I'm going to try my best to see if I can pull these two things apart so that you can see them as separate things because it gets a bit confusing. Let me give you an example. So what I have here on the screen is something that doesn't respond to the noise I make, because I haven't turned it up. Do, 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 Yeah, OK. Really good start. Well done. Let's just check this out. That's there. Where's my MIDI? MIDI's all working. Oh, awesome. Awesome there. Let's try that again. Do, 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 do. Definitely sound there. Give me a second. Sound, sound, sound. Active inputs. Da, 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 da. Oh, yeah, that's a bit sad. Do, 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 do. There we go. Things happened, right? I mean, you know, we'll come across all sorts of bugs and bits and pieces because I'm trying to cram a lot of stuff into a single system. If you are looking to run a little home studio on your computer at home, then it's not going to be changing all the time. You're not going to be sticking a thousand things in and out like I tend to. So if things are going to trip over here, it's just inevitable because I've already run about 15,000 bits of software with all sorts of different configurations. So, you know, just, just give us a little bit of grace in that regard. So... So we have a couple of things going on here. We have this, which is called a MIDI controller keyboard. Now this has no sound of its own. It has no sound. There's no audio output. There's no headphone socket. There's nothing from this that I can hear. It doesn't make any noise. And yet you can hear noise. How is that? Well, this is sending information on what keys have been pressed down the USB cable to the computer. The computer has taken that information, feeding it into this software synthesizer that I have on the screen, and that is generating the sound. So that is the relationship between MIDI and audio, generally speaking. MIDI sends data from key presses into a software or hardware device. It could as just as well be a hardware synthesizer like, like this fella here. It sends information to that device and that device responds to that information and creates a sound. MIDI here, audio coming out the other side. Okay, now there's lots of different ways that we can visualize this. The important thing to understand is that the only thing that this is generating is data. It's not generating sound. That's important because we can record the data that's coming from this we can record it into something called a sequencer and then we can play that back and edit it and change the sound that it's being sent to. You can't do that so much with audio. When you record from a microphone, we'll be doing some of this this evening, when you record, that recording is kind of committed to tape. It's essentially recorded a moment in time. It's recorded a performance. It's recorded a sound and that sound is digitalized on your computer. It's not something that you can then change the instrument of. You can process it and do all sorts of weird things to it, yes, but you can't fundamentally change what instrument has created that sound. You've recorded that sound. That is recording audio. 
recording MIDI is recording this data. Okay, I'm going to labor this point so thickly that it's going to drive you nuts. Let's look at something else. Which is instantly going to work. <laughs> of course, of course it is. So this is a program called StaffPad, which is a score writing piece of software. Now, if you consider what is being generated when you look at something like this MIDI keyboard, it's note information. It doesn't have to be. There can also be velocity information, how hard something is struck. There can be modulation information on moving a control within the destination. But essentially, you're recording note data, what notes have been pressed. And you can see this perhaps most clearly in a score. Now, the beautiful thing about MIDI is that it is just information. It is absolutely the score on the page. If you wanted to contrast the, the, the two things in another way, as I say, laboring the point, if you were to record a piece of music by writing down the score, you would not be recording the sound. You would be recording what notes were played and when. And if you like, once you've written them on a piece of paper, you could then edit them and have the tune be different. You could then give that sheet of score to a different musician and they could play it on a different instrument. That is MIDI. That's the nature of MIDI. It's just information being held which can then be edited and changed. If you stuck a microphone in front of the same musician and recorded it, that's recording audio. You can't then change the notes well, without special digital processing and you can't make it sound different. Yeah, MIDI and audio. So to demonstrate that even further, so this is this is MIDI, MIDI notes which have been recorded into this score as information, not as audio. So I can change the notes. Like so, very simply. Or I could draw all over it. Can't do that with audio. I can only do that with data that's MIDI. I could also potentially, though I'm terrible in staff pad, I could potentially draw in other notes. <laughs> I can't no, I can't do it at a distance. That's just impossible. None of this is gonna work. <laughs> I'll do it in another piece of software in a minute. Starpad is brilliant, right? Because you can sketch into it literally with a pen and it just interprets it as notes. But you have to at least draw a note of some kind of recognizable factor. And that's not what uh, uh, that's not what's happened here. However, what I could do is I could change the instruments which are being used. I think. Let me think about that for a second. No, not that. Not that. It's, it's, I know it's here somewhere. Do, 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 do. No, 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 no. No, I'll do that. No, no. I can't remember where it is. That's the metronome. There. Okay. So it was played back on strings, yeah? So if I turn that into something else, so I go to the violins, I'll swap those for a clarinet, um, saxophone for the violas, and a bassoon for the violoncellos. And if I now play it back, Now playing back with different instruments. That's because this is MIDI. 
it's just information. No actual sound has been recorded. And so I can change the instrument that that data is being thrown towards. Yeah. So MIDI is just information on what notes have been pressed. And you can send that information to any electronic instrument, which will then play back in response. All right. Does that sound, does that sound feasible to you? So that's, that's MIDI. Let's have a look at that in a different way. So this is a piece of software called Studio One. It's Adore, Adore as in D-A-W, Digital Audio Workstation. A digital Audio Workstation is the evolution of the sequencer and the tape based studio. Those two things have come together. They, they started off by being very much separate in hardware and then software sequencers came along in the sort of 80s and 90s and they ran their own thing alongside tape and then alongside digital tape and then eventually through the invention of Cubase VST, Cubase Audio, those things came together so you can have MIDI being recorded into a sequencer running alongside audio being recorded onto your hard drive. Very very interesting. I can talk about the history of these things if you like at some other point but at the moment we're just trying to focus on the whole MIDI and audio gambit. All right. So this is a door. A door is going to have a very similar environment, regardless of which one you have. Um, in Studio One, you have a nice blank page like this. What I'm going to do is I'm going to create an instrument. Presence, say, drop that in there. I've only got a few instruments installed. There we go, some nice violins. Now I'm going to record this MIDI into Studio One just to demonstrate what happens when I do that. go. So what's been recorded? Purely the presses on the keyboard. Going to open this up a bit so you can see it. Oops. No, evidently I'm not going to do that. Yes I am. There we go. <laughs> so commonly within, uh, well no, let's, let's cross over between the two things that we saw before. So if I click to edit this, if I go to score view, Check the browser. So this is the information that I've just recorded, expressed as a score. So this is the same as what we had in staff pad. It's purely taken the notes that I've played and has put them into a musical form, into a score that we can understand. We can see that that's music. And similarly with staff pad, I can change the instrument because the instrument is not set. It's not been recorded as sound. All that we've recorded is the notes that have been pressed. That information, the trigger of this note, the E going down and the F going down, all of these notes have a start point and an end point, and it's that data, that information that's been recorded into the score. Yeah? And again, I can edit it, I can pick up a pen and I can stick in more notes and such like, and the violin that I've loaded up will play it back, or I can change it into a different instrument. This is MIDI. 
Now, in a door, in this kind of recording sequencer environment, we most, we most commonly view MIDI information as what's called a piano roll, which is this here. It's ultimately just a, a simpler way of displaying the same information that you have on the score. This is exactly what we were seeing on the score. You've got a note start point and a note end point, and you've got a picture of the piano which gives you exactly what pitch has been played. And as you can see as I press my keyboard here, it's reflected in the piano roll there. The concept of the piano roll comes directly from those country and western type pianos you'd see in old western movies that you have a, a roll, a piano roll that goes inside and that ticks around and that triggers the notes. This is what, this is kind of based on that idea. And I can go in here and I can pick up notes and I can move them about, place them in time, place them in space. In fact, I don't even need a keyboard to play. I could take a mouse and enter notes that way. So that, that's what MIDI is about. That's what sequencing is about. Why is that important? Why would you want to use that? Well, MIDI gives you access to a whole range of software sounds, of uh, instruments, whether they're sample-based instruments so that they're very live sounding or authentic sounding. They could be synthesizers and models. They could be all sorts of currently unimagined sounds that are generated by the computer for you in response to your playing. So it can turn your little computer, your little home computer, your laptop into a sound source, a source of synthesizers, a source of instruments, a source of pianos, electric pianos, drums, percussion. All of these things can be available to you within your computer. Often, when you buy a door like Studio One, it comes with a whole bunch of sounds ready to go. And all you've got to do is install the software, plug in a keyboard, and off you go. Yeah, kind of. It's kind of that simple. We'll get on to why that might not be so simple in a little bit. But that's the general idea. So armed purely with a computer, maybe even a MIDI keyboard, you can have an awesome workstation synthesizer type keyboard where you can record and edit all of the key presses, arrange your music into something spectacular. <laughs> At this point, I should probably demo something. Well, there's a demo song within Studio One. Let me load that up just quickly, just to give you an example. And then we'll start talking about audio a bit more. Uh, I had, where was it? I had it. I had it. I had a thing. How was it? There we go. Uh, come on. So this is a demo song within uh, Studio One, and what you're looking at is the, the general recording and playback and mixing environment that you get within a door. Because MIDI is only one half of the story, the other half is audio recording. And the fact that these two are so meshed well together that it is often difficult to tell them apart. So within the project here, hopefully you can see that you've got numerous squiggly bits of what are essentially waveforms on these tracks. And these are audio tracks. These are actual recorded sound on each of these tracks, as if it was a tape machine. There might also be MIDI in here. I didn't actually check, although this might just all be audio. <laughs> doesn't matter because we're moving on to the audio side of things. So within your door you have the MIDI that you can make and sequence and then you have audio recording that you can record directly in using microphones. Microphones or line level inputs or mixers or bits and pieces however it is you get your sound into here which we'll talk about in a moment and you can have it play 
uh, you can arrange your entire recordings within here, multi-track. So everything you can hear here is recorded onto a track as audio, as sound, through mics, onto a computer. So I can solo a track. We seem to be into the drums at the minute. So in this essence, your computer becomes a multi-track recording studio. That's the thing. Because you may feel it's all very well playing around with little sounds and little keyboards and recording those sorts of things, doing some score writing. Yeah, you can see that. But actually then, within a door environment, your computer can become a fully fledged recording studio. I've got a mixer here. I've got multiple tracks of recorded audio. I can literally plug a dozen microphones into my surface and record direct to the internal hard drive. You need no expensive, potentially, uh, extra additional equipment. You can do it simply, you can do it cheaply, and you can become an entire producer within this environment. You have mixing, you have effects, you have processing, you have editing. You can lay out your tracks, you can put tracks alongside each other, you can copy and paste. So you can put your guitar solo all over the place. So that's what we're talking about. We're talking about turning our little home computer into a studio. Just give me a minute, I'll have a drink. And you have a think about that. You just think about the potential, think about the ramifications of all that. And I'll talk about how things are connected together. <clears throat> so, am I saying that all you need is a computer? No, I don't think I am saying that. You could do that. <coughs> Cool, that's good stuff, that. I better have some more. Thanks, it's and I appreciate. I appreciate that, mate. Just give me a tick. Ugh. So uh, again, how do we how do I demonstrate this? How do I get this across? How how can it be possible to plug a microphone into your computer? I mean, if you've got a laptop, it's going to have a microphone built in, right? And it's got speakers built in as well. If you've got a desktop, you might have some gaming speakers, or you might have a headset with a microphone. All of those things can potentially get sound into your computer, but it's going to sound rubbish. And that's not really what we want. I mean, sure, we're all into free stuff these days, so free software. Sure, there are bits of free software out there. In fact, I'm going to show you Zen Beats in a moment, and that is a free piece of software and you can use it for creating music. But you might want to invest in a couple of things in order to make your music making experience on a computer much more fluid, much more reliable, much more joyful, perhaps, is the best word. So the two bits of gear that I would solidly recommend for your music making are a keyboard, a MIDI keyboard of some kind. There are so many out these days. Lots and lots. Some of them are the same. Some of them are exactly the same, so it seems. And you would want one of these because it allows you to knock out tunes simpler than it does using a mouse. You can use a mouse. Nothing wrong in using a mouse. Plenty of musicians don't ever touch a MIDI keyboard, but I would suggest that it's a useful thing to you. The next thing that's useful is an audio interface. Is that in shot? Can you see that? I think so. What is an audio interface? This is a very, very key component. Let me get another one so I don't have to unplug that. <clears throat> Now, 
Now, audio interfaces come in lots of different shapes and sizes. This is one of my favorites. It's called the Motu M2. I'm using the M4 at the moment plugged in here, so I thought I might need some extra inputs. I don't know, who knows, anyway. So what this box does, and as I say, there's lots of different types and sorts of them, but they do a very similar thing. This box is going to solve two, maybe even three problems. The first problem it solves is how do I get a microphone into my laptop or into my computer? Sure, sure, we've got a little mini jack socket on the back somewhere, that's fine. But you know, you want a, um, <laughs> you want, uh, you want one that looks like this. Let me go back to a, a bit closer up on this. Do you want something like this? This sort of microphone, a proper microphone, a proper microphone that a singer would use, something that's going to re record and make nice sounds. Because ultimately, if you're turning your computer into a studio, you want to be able to record and capture a nice sound. So how on earth do you get that into your computer? Well, the only way is to use an audio interface. So the first thing it gives you is a proper connection to plug your microphone into. It may give you one connection. It may give you eight. It may give you 24. It just depends on how much money you want to sink into it. So this one here, it connects simply by USB, gives you two inputs. The other thing it gives you is outputs. Why are outputs important? Well, because up to now you might have been listening to it on some crappy speakers that are built into your laptop or crappy speakers that you play games through. They might even be half decent speakers, but they're gonna be coming out of the computer on a little mini jack output, which is not going to give you the best possible sound quality. Whereas on the back of one of these, you're gonna have proper jack outputs, normally even phono outputs. And they're going to be solid and low noise, uh, wide frequency range, dynamic range. It's going to sound brilliant. You may also get hardware controls over things, gain controls for your microphones, um, output controls, headphone sockets. All of these things are encapsulated within an audio interface to provide you with the connections you need to turn your computer into a recording studio. I mean, you, of course, of course, you can just do it with the inbuilt microphone. You can do that and you can do it on headphones coming out the other side. Fine, that's completely fine, do that. In fact, you can do that on your phone. You can get, you can make a little home studio on your, on your telephone, on your smart telephone, and that will work also. Similarly, these sorts of things will also plug into a phone if you get the right one with the right connections and the right number of dongles. But by the by, the point is that something of this nature is going to allow you to easily plug in microphones, guitars, instruments, anything else you want to record into your computer. So this is a vital purchase, the vital companion to your computer music making. It's the thing you're going to need. Right, have we got that across? <laughs> the other thing it does is it provides a more professional uh, a professional driver. What does that mean? It means that it's connection to your computer via the USB port, or it might be Thunderbolt, it could be Firewire back in the old days. That connection is going to have a driver that runs it. And the speed at which that runs, the quality and stability with which that audio functions is going to be much, much greater than using the inbuilt Windows audio engine. Obviously I'll talk to Pete about this tomorrow night because he may have something to say on that matter. But generally speaking, and I'm talking about PCs, I mean this this is applicable to Macs as well and if you're running Linux then sure knock yourself out. It, these general concepts do apply but I always focused on Windows specifically. Uh, with Windows you are going to get a much better quality sound, you're going to get a much faster response and a much lower latency. Now, latency is a is something that's going to come up, and it's a word that gets banded around. And I'll maybe I'll talk a bit about that in a minute. But suffice to say that with the right sort of audio interface, latency is not going to be an issue. It's not going to be a problem you're really going to run into. Latency generally comes about when you're trying to use inbuilt technology within Windows. The reason being is that 
uh, Windows needs to be able to run a gazillion different bits of hardware and it needs to be able to deliver uh, audio playback from games, audio playback from movies in a smooth steady stream that's not interrupted or glitching. So to do that it creates a buffer. A buffer is like a, a bucket or a space, a little room where it can put stuff together so it comes out nicely. But it takes time to put things together within this buffer. And that time we experience as a delay. Now if you're watching a movie you don't experience a delay because when you press play it takes a moment for it to start and that delay is built in at the front so you don't experience it during during the movie. Don't experience it during a game either because that sort of lag is just not noticeable when you're wanging around in some kind of first person shooter. However, when you are making music, the speed of response of sound is vitally important. Vitally important. You cannot have a piano sound not playing when you hit the key and have it play a moment afterwards. That's no good. You can't try to play drums and have the drums slightly behind you. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. You can't sing through a reverb effect and have your voice echoing somewhere behind you. No, you need to have that latency down to essentially nothing. That is what an audio interface can do. So to summarize, the audio interface provides you with physical connections in, physical connections out and it provides you with high quality audio. The sound itself being recorded is of a high quality and you have a very fast data transfer between this and the computer so that latency, the magic word, is not really an issue for you. The audio interface, I thank you, I thank you. <clears throat> Uh, someone's popped up with a question which might be worth uh, talking about which is that um, the question from Andrew is does USB 3 make much of a difference with latency etc not really <laughs> is the answer I mean all these various protocols whether it's USB 1 2 3 USB A USB C Thunderbolt Firewire all these different things essentially provide a data connection between two devices uh, the speed of that connection is usually far in excess of what you need to record audio. So what tends to happen as we go from USB 1, for instance, to USB 2, you tend to get more bandwidth. So USB 1 can only really handle stereo in and out um, at a time. USB 2, open that up so you can now do 8 tracks in and out without any bother. USB 3 has expanded that even further. Thunderbolt similarly expands the amount of data you can get over the line at the same time. It doesn't tend to have a whole lot to do with the speed with which that happens. Now with Thunderbolt, certainly they've managed to get latency times down um, even lower than USB, uh, USB 2, but not really by much. I mean a sliver of a millisecond. So I don't think those are, I think basically we have got down about as fast as we're going to get. I mean we're talking about one or two milliseconds. How much is one or two milliseconds? Well it's, it's no time, at, it's nothing. Um, you get three milliseconds I think, I'm trying to remember exactly now, this is sort of data that I should have off the top of my head, um, that uh, three milliseconds is about standing six feet away from your speaker. So you're going to get milliseconds of latency just by sitting in your studio and having your speakers on the other side of the room. If you're for instance playing a grand piano you get that sort of latency all the time. It's there inherent in the instrument because the strings are so far away from you. So when people get obsessed about low latency um, it becomes it's almost something that you need to remind yourself is not as important as you think. I mean, I've been to plenty of studios who have, or who aren't set up. You know, I've gone in to deliver a computer to, a, uh, to, to various studios and their current system isn't even remotely set up for any kind of sensible latency because it's not important. If you were recording to tape, it takes a time for the tape 
to spin up. And so latency is a normal thing within a studio environment. It's only because of computers and virtual instruments and things like that that it's become a much bigger issue. And in a, in a normal studio environment, things like latency are normal and they work around it. So it no longer becomes a problem. Where am I going with this? I don't know. So yeah, new protocols, new forms of USB are helpful because they allow us to, to broaden the amount of input and output we can get, but they rarely produce um, a significant change in the speed of things, I would suggest. Uh, Steve asks, would I need to be concerned about compatibility between USB types and hardwares and drivers, etc.? No, no, not really. I mean, the majority of computers these days will be USB 2 and above. Uh, USB 2 and 3 are completely compatible. USB 1, not so much because it doesn't necessarily have as much power by voltage to drive your audio interface that might require powering. And it may not have the bandwidth to cope with all the audio going in and out. USB 2 completely sorts that out. And in the vast majority of cases, your USB port will be USB 2. It won't, won't remotely be a problem. Um, so, you know, any hardware interface that you buy, excuse me, will specify which port it needs to be plugged into. Now you may find that if you've got, particularly when it comes to a desktop computer, you might have a whole row of USB ports. Which one should it be plugged into? Well, the only way to know is to try them out. And it's certainly the case that some ports work better than others. Why? Nobody knows. It's part of the, the magic source of, uh, of PC desktops. No one knows. No one has a clue. It doesn't really matter. You just keep plugging it into different ones until it works. <laughs> That's the best advice. That's the best advice, really. I mean, into my Surface here. Now, I've used this a lot in a lot of different configurations, so much so that the poor machine is very confused as to what I've plugged in most of the time. But in this particular scenario, because this is, this is the Surface Pro 7, it has both a USB port and a USB-C port. So a regular one and a USB-C one. The MIDI keyboard here is plugged into the regular USB port here. No, it's not. That's a lie. That's a complete lie. This is plugged into a hub. Da -da. This hub here. Uh, this hub is just a USB. 3 hub is plugged into the side of here and I'm plugging my keyboard into there along with a dongle that I forgot about and this I was transferring some files off. That is completely happy. You don't have to have one device into one port. There is more than enough bandwidth on USB 2, USB 3 to support multiple devices. And before the Surface Pro 7, all the other surfaces have a single USB port and I would have a, a hub and everything going in there. Keyboard, audio interface, sometimes an external hard drive for samples, um, other controllers, dongles, all attached to that same one port. And it works. It doesn't have to be difficult. It doesn't have to be crazy. Don't listen to the people who are saying you need one port per device. It's just, it's just not true. It's just simply not true. But sometimes some trial and error is required, I would say. So into the USB-C port, I've got my Moto M4 here because it is a USB-C device. Brilliant. So the two are actually getting their own port in, which, I mean, that's no bad thing. I'm not saying that you should put everything down the one funnel because if you can spread it out, then that just makes your life easier, I think. Does the hub have to be powered, uh, says Ken? No, however, <laughs> you will run into limitations if it's not, um, particularly from a laptop, because a laptop only has so much power in it, it can't power everything indefinitely. And so you will run into a situation where you'll add one extra device and the whole thing will just kind of go, oh, it will creak and then fall over. You don't really want that. So yeah, I've used uh, powered hubs a lot because it's just simpler and safer. And you can get powered hubs that have got like eight or 10 ports on and you can plug loads of stuff into that and run it straight into your computer. Windows can cope with that, should be able to cope with that. But again, a little bit of trial and error might be required. And you will come to a point at which it's not going to work. 
So what hub is then the next question everybody asks? Which hub should I get? Which hub? I have no clue. If you go to Amazon and go USB hub, there's a, a thousand million, a thousand million of them all looking the same. <laughs> and there's no way of knowing which of those is going to work. You know, you could try to go for a name brand like Belkin, for instance, and think, oh, yeah, that's going to work because that's 10 times more expensive than anybody else's. Well, maybe, but I've had no problem at all with all sorts of funny looking um, USB hubs. I've probably got one in the drawer here. Yeah. That's... Uh. For instance, that's an, an anchor, an anchor one. It's uh, powered out the back. You plug a little plug into it and then it gives you a load of stuff. Yeah, that seemed to work great. But I've had all sorts of different ones and all of them seem to work fine on the most part. As with all bits of technology that you'll buy for your computer, buy it, try it. If it doesn't work, send it back. <laughs> Simple. Simple. So, so yeah, hubs, not a problem. In connecting everything into your computer, it should not, should not be a problem. If you're just supporting one controller, one audio interface, then a, a passive hub is completely fine. If you're going for more than that, then yeah, a powered uh, USB hub is going to provide you with that sort of next level of stability. You're not going to be worried about losing power at any point or that it's draining your internal battery quite so quickly. Don't run on battery. I'd never recommend running on battery if you're trying to power other devices and get stable audio. Anyway, right, so at this point, I think it's important that we do a little bit of music making, yeah, just to demonstrate these two things coming together. You know, it's all very well looking at a massive project, yeah, that's great. But how can you make music yourself? How possible is that? What does that look like? Right, let's do that. Now, for the, pur pur blah, 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 the purposes of this, I will use Roland Zen Beats. Now, I've been a big fan of Zen Beats for many, 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 many years, back when it was called Stage Light. Uh, the reason that I've liked it is because it's very touch focused and so perfect for running on something like the Surface. Now, since uh, Roland took it on a year ago, I think it was, and turned it into Zen Beats, um, Roland has stuck in a whole load of Roland type content like drum sounds and other bits and pieces and they have moved it on a little bit so that now it runs on pretty much every platform. You can run it on, on Windows, on Mac, you can run it on Linux, you can run it on iOS, you can run it on a Raspberry Pi, I believe. All sorts of places and all of these things are cross compatible as in you can open the project on one, fiddle with it, save it, open it on another. It's flipping brilliant, totally brilliant. In fact, I will show you that, I think. I might show you that. <laughs> uh, possibly. So, Zen Beats then. Let's find that and run that. <clears throat> so, Zen Beats, you can go and download it from the Roland website and you can install it right now and you can get on with it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn it on. I'm going to, to make a quick recording, both MIDI, I think, and audio. And just to show you potentially how that works. In fact, I'm not even going to explain it. I think I might just do it. Should I just do it? Let's just do it. Right, I'll bring my microphone in. And then we can talk about it afterwards. <laughs> now, the <laughs> now how well is it going to go is my question. I don't know. Anyway, so, um, yeah, I'll just go and I'll see you on, on the other end. Let me put this on to here so you can see both things going on at once. I think that would be good. <clears throat> so I might do a bit of stand. I might not stand up. I don't know. <laughs> what I'm going to do is take my glasses off so that I can see because that makes complete sense.
Yeah, there you go. As simple as that. This is Roland Zen Beats operating as your own little recording studio. Let's don't need that microphone sticking me in the head anymore. <clears throat> it's simple, it's easy, it's fruity, it's creative, and it allows you to build up tracks in any way you like. I mean, I tied myself into the looping side of Zen Beats because it has two different ways of looking at it. Excuse me, you can look at it as a place where you create patterns and loops and then arrange those together, or you can simply have a timeline and you record freeform whatever you like. Just a you know, just a song on guitar or or not with a metronome or not quantized or not. It's an open page, you know, it's a blank page for you to record into. It's a piece of tape, it's all of those things. And it contains software instruments, so the, the sound of the drums, for instance, comes from um, a bunch of samples that are being played. The bass comes from a, a MIDI sound source. In fact, if I change that, which I can, if I can remember how, <laughs> I can change the sound. Because it's MIDI, I can change the sound, yeah? Now when it comes to audio, I can't change the sound that's been recorded because it's been recorded as actual sound. That was my guitar plugged in and being recorded, yeah? So it's not like MIDI, I can't change the notes, I can't change what's been recorded, 
but I can process it a bit. I can edit it, I can chop and tail it, I can copy and paste it, things like that. Or I could, for instance, add um, some effects to it. So let's add a delay, for instance. Or I could take the voice Add a bunch of reverb to that. Or I could add like a, an amplifier type effect to the lead guitar. I don't know if you can see in the software, I'm just using one, one column of loops. I can uh, move this about to other columns. Uh, I can copy and paste it, I think, if I can remember the right, um, uh, if I can remember the right key combination. There we go. So I could very quickly then move through different scenes. Like so, it's a recording studio. It's a creative place where I can make and arrange and mix music. I can edit the MIDI notes if that's what I want to do, or add new ones. It even gives me a virtual keyboard where I could play if you have a touchscreen. I mean, this will also run on an iPad, so you could use it on that if you prefer. If you're using Mac OS, obviously, then the touch is not a thing for you. That's okay, you can use it just as well with a mouse and a controller keyboard. But hopefully that gives you an idea of how these things work together. So I needed my keyboard in order to tap in the bass, although of course I can do it with a mouse. I needed the audio interface to plug in my guitar and my microphone, otherwise how on earth could I get in there? How on earth could I get that in there? And then on the opposite side, everything is playing back beautifully out of the back of the audio interface into some proper speakers. Well, kind of, it's going up over on the live stream. But you get, you get the idea, you get the idea. So, and as I say, one of the brilliant things is that I can go here and save it. Save song, song, save as. I save it as, um, I don't know, molten and I'm going to save it to the cloud. So it's thinking about it, it's going to need to upload it. Yeah, thanks, Alan. <laughs> I didn't say that any of the singer was going to be good. Didn't say it was going to be any good. Uh, phone upside down. No. Um, oh, come on. Wake up. Thank you. All right, so that's uploaded. I can then go to Zen Beats on my phone. Zen Beats on the phone. Is that working? Let's put that in there. Yeah, yeah, okay. Zen Beats on the phone like a bit like that so <laughs> moment there i thought i'd have the whole thing upside down that would have been silly wouldn't it anyway i can go to open go to my one driver i put it so it's a test i did earlier look at that see i did do some prep and that's 
that one. I'm going to load it up. That might take a second or two. So all that wonderful recording I did at home into my, my laptop, I can now, is now here. It's now on here. It's just, it's, it boggles my mind. Like that, yeah. <laughs> I think that's just genius. I think that's completely genius. Now, so I just need to get back to my video um, software thingy. Right, yes, so there you go. So that was MIDI and audio being recorded into the computer as if it's some kind of recording studio, like what you know studios have. But then I could also upload it to, to the Magic Internet and go and play with it on the bus on my phone. And any changes that I make, I can upload and bring back to here. You know, that kind of power is extraordinary. Absolutely extraordinary. But whatever sort of music you like, whatever sort of um, music you want to do, the computer can absolutely act as the heart of that. Whether it's recording from piano keyboards, whether it's recording from other synthesizers and instruments, it doesn't have to be internal. You don't have to use internal sounds, you can use external sounds. You can route MIDI out of the back of a box like this into other things. You could run a little external synthesizer like this, or a huge external synthesizer, because this also has MIDI on the back, or it can act over USB. Because USB MIDI is exactly the same as regular MIDI. Uh, I'm just going to look for a, a, a cable. Do I have a cable to hand that's got MIDI on it? Yeah. All right. So you know, the actual cabling for MIDI has now got complicated. Complicated because it was trying to make things easier. Your traditional MIDI is this. It's, oh, let's put it under here, look, even better. It's a five pin DIN. Oh, get out of there, there we go. Uh, they chose that because it was a common format at the time, which then promptly died. But that's what we've got, 5 pin DIN. And you will find that on the back of devices, like so, 5 pin DINs there, you see. And that allows you to connect MIDI from one device to another. So I can play this synth from a different keyboard using a MIDI cable. Now, USB can also provide the same functionality. What am I looking at now? This camera can provide the same functionality, just in, it includes a connection to the computer. So you no longer have to have a little box which provides the MIDI connection to the computer. You just plug the USB cable straight in. That installs the, the, the keyboard for you, also powers it and provides the MIDI connection. The other thing we have these days is this weirdness as well, which is mini jack MIDI. Mini jack MIDI on the end of this cable here. And that's because some bright spark realized that MIDI only actually uses two pins. It doesn't need all five of the pins that are inside this cable. And so you can actually use it with um, mini jack cables. And that makes patching things together much easier because we've got mini jack cables, we already have that in other things. And we can just patch that together beautifully without having to carry these big chunky cables. The only problem was that there was very quickly two formats that were wired differently. So we find ourselves in a situation where we have this kind of really easy format of mini jack MIDI, but with two incompatible formats driving us all nuts because we've always got the wrong cable and the wrong adapter and it just doesn't work. So using a good old fashioned MIDI cable is often, it's often the easiest things. So, have another think. <laughs> and uh, I mean, I've been doing this for about an hour, which sounds about right, and I think I've got across the idea. So let me have a swig of this. I might even open a beer. 
and I'll summarise, and then we'll take some questions and see where we get to. <clears throat> so the computer has a recording studio it is absolutely completely feasible it has been for 20 years it's not a problem there's no problem with getting audio in, getting audio out. There's no problem with playing um, virtual instruments, virtual sounds, and recording all of that. There's no difficulty in arranging tracks, arranging huge pieces of audio recordings and MIDI recordings, orchestral pieces, bands, record a band straight in. No problem. None of this is a problem. Now, people do encounter problems. It is true. and. We're going to talk about that on Friday. This Friday, I'm going to have a live stream all about Windows tweaking and talking about the problems and issues that we have. I'm also talking to Pete from Microsoft tomorrow night, where no doubt things like this will probably come up and we'll talk about them as well. So people do have issues. I appreciate that. The reason that I've had a career building computers for studios is precisely because people have problems trying to run computers with audio. But we have to sort of temper our expectations a little bit. If you want, if you need to run a proper studio where your computer needs to be working all the time, every day, you know, seven days a week, thank you, um, then you need to get a, a properly made, properly supported computer. That's just the reality of it. Whether that's Mac or PC, doesn't matter. However, if you just want to run a home studio, do your own recording, make your own music, then you can, should be able to do that on any computer. That should be totally possible. The right piece of hardware, uh, the right piece of software, there's no reason why you can't do that, is what I'm saying. <clears throat> and there are some fantastic software synths out these days. You know, it's just totally amazing. No reason at all. No reason at all. 
So, oh, a couple of questions uh, have come in. Let's let's go through a few of those, and then maybe we can uh, expand what we're talking about and and get to the root of things that that trouble people about this sort of thing. So, uh, Andrew's asked some questions, but then they're usually irrelevant, so I tend to ignore them. But oh, okay, on this occasion, uh, you're familiar with the basics. Good for you. Good for you, sir. Glad I've come to to my pub tonight. <laughs> Good, and you have Zen Beats. Great. Well, thanks for that, Andrew. That's that's appreciated. So, cheers for that. <clears throat> you were also asking. Um, oh, what? Okay, nice things. That's <clears throat> that's appreciated. I thank you for that. Johnny, hey, <clears throat> good to see you, man. Thanks for dropping in. So let's see if I can actually find some real questions amongst all the nonsense being talked about. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah, Zen Beats on Android. Yes, indeed. It's great. It's great. Uh, it gets overlooked often. I mean, you know, when Open Labs were, were running it, it it had things that are missing. It probably still does. I haven't looked into version two, particularly of Zenbeats, very deeply, because there were things like audio and uh, audio editing was missing very much, um, vocal comping. Um, what else was missing? Some of the finer points of, of editing stuff uh, was not there that you would find in other doors. Um, but the most part, largely, it was all there. So I'm quite excited to have a look at it a little bit deeper. Um, with version 2. Also their sample verse thing that's happened just before Roland took over is an excellent synthesizer. It's a sampler slash um, uh, virtual instrument which is, is brilliant and well worth the entry fee on its own. Not that there is an entry fee, however if you do give them a little bit of money like $25 or something you can unlock it so it supports VST instruments and other bits and pieces rather than just the internal stuff and that's well worth well worth doing it. You also get expanded versions of all their own instruments which which are great. So yeah I've got a lot of time, a lot of time for Zen Beats, a lot of time. <clears throat> What's the beer, Ken? It's uh, it's Brew Dog. I'm afraid, not too exciting, but you know it does for me. So Johnny asks, "What my personal preferred door is for music making nowadays?" Now that's that's a good question because. Um, I've had such a, a, a an evolutionary history with recording software because the main reason being that uh, I used to work at a very famous music shop uh, for many years and I did support for everybody ev everybody <laughs> if somebody bought a piece of software from the shop for some reason they wouldn't phone up Steinberg well usually because there's no phone number and so they'd phone me up and I'd have to answer all the questions um, similarly, on the shop floor, I used to have to demo every single piece of software. So I knew Logic, I knew Cubase, I knew Performer, I knew Pro Tools, I knew Reason, uh, I knew the whole lot, Cakewalk, everything, Sibelius, for heaven's sake, the whole lot you had to do, the whole lot I had to, to demonstrate and support. So I was constantly um, making music and testing in all of these different, in all of these different places. I did uh, originally get into Logic, which was really, really hard back in the day. This is version three of Logic. Um, and then version four, which thankfully brought along a few things like you could actually make music by starting the software as opposed to having to create the environment yourself in which music happened. We don't really need to go into all this. Suffice to say, I, I, I started on Logic on the, the PC and then when that was bought by Apple and that was all closed down I moved to Cubase for a good long while. Also dabbled in um, Cakewalk, um, Sonar, uh, often. I'd make deviations into Reaper, deviations into Pro Tools. Um, I did a system called the Pro Tools PC for a long time so I did a lot of Pro Tools support. 
and needed to know that piece of software a lot better than I did at the time. But I never enjoyed myself in Pro Tools. It never felt like a creative space. It felt like a, a, a slow banging of your head against a wall to actually achieve anything. Um, then from there, I bounced around between Cubase and um, Traction and Bitwig started coming in, Ableton Live, these sorts of things. I did a lot of live performance in Ableton Live, so I got to learn that, which I then morphed into Bitwig because I needed the touch control. And so that's become that became a favorite of mine when using the Surface. But now, coming full round to where we are now, I use Studio One is what I use most of the time. Possibly the reason for that is because I write a column for Sound on Sound about Studio One, so I kind of have to be using it, really. And so that's what I tend to use the most. And honestly, I've also written the review of Studio One since version three for Sound on Sound magazine, and it has come on leaps and bounds. It's amazing, really. It's quite extraordinary. Although, I mean, I did, I also wrote a review of Cubase 11 very, very recently, and Cubase has really come on. I haven't given Cubase a lot of thought since probably version eight or nine. I mean, when I was building computers every day, I would be installing Cubase, I'd be installing Pro Tools, I'd be installing all these bits of software for people and testing them to make sure that they work. But I haven't done that for a couple of years now, and so I, I don't tend to go through that process anywhere near as often as I did. Um, so I, I'm able to be a bit more picky about what I use. And so, yeah, Studio One is definitely doing it. It's, it's amazing. Although I still have to give everything a bit of thought because I have so many workflows stuck in my head that every time I sit down with whatever door, I'm scratching my head a little bit going, now which one is this? Is this the one that does that? Is that the shortcut? <laughs> so, you know, I'm not the most efficient person within uh, any given door because I kind of know them all and so means I don't know any of them particularly well. But Studio One is what I use these days. There is a free version of Studio One so you can get started straight with it. Um, and there's a sort of a middle version, an artist version, and then a professional version. But it's it's brilliant. It's well worth your time, uh, particularly now. You know, it's filled in with version five. It filled in a few gaps, which is brilliant, and has got some really innovative bits and pieces in there as well. It's great. I mean, doors are extraordinary. It amazes me how they're still able to develop and produce new things and come up with ideas uh, within that space that's been around for such a long time. Yes, interesting. <clears throat> uh, Manuel, uh, Manuel, Manuel, I don't know, some bloke, right, asks, is, are there any heating issues uh, when using the surface? Uh, there can be, yes, but part of the knack of using uh, an Ultrabook style computer is that you have to use it within the limitations that it offers. If you, excuse me, if you are caning it up to 90% all the time, then yeah, it's gonna to get too hot and then the processor will step down. That's the nature of the processor within this sort of computer. And so you don't push it that far because it's gonna cause you trouble. Does that make sense? There's no, you know, and so in my usage of it and when I demo it, when I'm playing live, um, particularly actually when I'm playing live, I tend to mix everything down to audio. So I'm using audio loops rather than MIDI, so I'm not having to load up instruments, unless it's an instrument that I want to play. But when I'm using something like Bitwig and live performance and you're essentially triggering off uh, loops, then I make them all audio because that's less taxing on the processor and I have no idea what environment I'm gonna be performing in until you get there. So, so yeah. If you're using a product like the Surface, you just have to use it intelligently within the, the power that it can give you. Otherwise, don't use it. Use something else. Buy a really thick, chunky desktop laptop, and then you won't have those sorts of, those sorts of issues. Because, yeah, sure, they are there, and the processor will step down if it gets too hot. But you know that. So if you know that, you can work around it, yeah? Cool. 20 years, 20 years on Fruity Loops. Wow, that's a long time to stay with a bit of, with a demo. <laughs> Hasn't that timed out by now? <laughs> I 
Now, FL, FL Studio is also a piece of software that's come on amazingly. Absolutely amazingly. I did a lot of work on that a few years ago, again, on the Surface and on using touchscreens. <clears throat> it has a real vibe to it that nothing else has, I think. It's, it's very unique. It tends to lend itself to a particular form of music, I suppose. But um, yeah, it's, it's very, very interesting. If you are into to EDM type music, loop based stuff, synth based stuff, then yeah, it's, it's definitely worth your time. And as I say, they've come on a great deal in the audio side of things, recording side of things, because it, it wasn't very good at that. It was kind of like a separate process. You had to record into it and then dump it into a track rather than recording directly onto tracks like any other door. So it was odd in that respect, but it's come on, definitely. And um, it's, it's a potential contender. I think it carries a lot of baggage. That's its only thing. It does tend to work. It sort of has a has a gaming workflow somehow if that makes sense. <clears throat> now I don't know how to use it properly either, but that was my that was my take on it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Cubase Eleven, yeah, still uses the old, uh, the old dongle. I've had my dongle since about nineteen ninety nine, I think just about hanging in there got tape wrapped around it and stuff so yeah yeah that's still running on a dongle a dongle uh, if you've tried um, mr. window liquor if you've tried uh, Ableton and never quite got on with it do give bitwig a go because it has a similar level of functionality but works in a different enough way uh, and it's I think a more accessible way I think Ableton live can be difficult um, to get into uh, there's something about it's you know if i may say it's so it's kind of german in its precision and its accuracy and its love of smallness <laughs> um uh you know it's like uh, it's, uh, i would say it's like a bit like electron um and like the digitac and things like that it has a certain electronic workflow to it that doesn't gel with everybody whereas bitwick is a bit more fruity a bit more open um lends itself to other possibilities <clears throat> any thoughts on the freely available cakewalk um yeah yeah uh yes the yeah that's quite remarkable cakewalk being bought out by band lab um amazing yeah and then they released it for free amazing also amazing i mean sonar was always good um i mean it it had its problems i mean i mean because it was being owned by gibson essentially that's always a difficult place to be because they don't really know what they're doing half the time. They don't know what they're doing with their guitars, let alone the bits of software and other things that they own. So it's kind of ran into this in this place where it couldn't seem to get past itself because there were difficulties. Uh, there were areas in it which were just clumsy and difficult. The, um, I would never enjoy the arrange page. I mean, that's the basic main place you spend your time in a door is arranging music and it would drive me nuts it worked differently and awkwardly enough um you know differently to any other sort of door just to make it hard it was really hard uh, there's a also the way it named its inputs and outputs simple things that would just drive me crazy so uh immensely powerful uh the mixing in it was great touch control 
it was great they'd even introduced some uh, some loop and clip launching which was was working really well it kind of suffered from this legacy interface that felt very old school felt very old windows um never felt as as professional as perhaps some others now since band lab have essentially released it for free it's flipping awesome i mean it's a complete recording studio for free that works um so you can't really argue with that the other one, I mean, if you're looking for a free door, the other one I would recommend trying is Waveform from Traction Corporation. Um, it's now, I believe, the first version of Waveform is now the free one. Uh, they're now up to um, version 10 or 11 or something. So I think it's version 8, which is the free version. But it's a fully fledged, fully working door that's really interesting. Got a lot of fascinating clip functionality within the arrange page and incredible modulation i mean it's a door that has like a bin of lfos that you can drag around the place to move stuff around nothing else no other door has anything of of the sort so you can start modulating your, your faders or your parameters on this or something to do with the clip or the way things are, are set out any parameter at any point you can just stuff modulation into it's brilliant it's totally brilliant it's not the easiest way in. It seems a bit boggling to start with. There's um, quite a bit of, uh, I don't know, text, not really. Things are, parameters are labeled very simply and it's not always the prettiest, but um, the, the latest versions it's got are, are, are pretty awesome. I used, for some reason I used to have a lot more time and I used to, to review doors more often. Uh, I don't seem to find the time now, which is a shame. And I'd, I'd like I'd like to recommit to doing a bit more of that. That's part of why this week has come about, is because I'm I have not paid enough attention to software, and I really should be, because it's it's part of what I do and it's part of what I'm I'm good at and I and I know about. And so I want to make sure that I'm doing regular bits of software content uh, for you good people out there. So it's not all just modular. Although that's fun, I mean that's a lot of fun. That's why I like spending time there. But um, software is important too, and I think it's a good thing to talk about. And I think I have something to contribute to that conversation. Uh, Adam says, "Yeah, yeah, um, that there are such a lot of possibilities it becomes overwhelming to comprehend." Yes, yes, it does. Can I explain what MIDI is and what could be done with it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, MIDI is simply a, a data language between two devices. What it means is that, I mean, you can use it for anything. You can MIDI control anything you like. The sort of information that goes out over MIDI, musical instrument digital interface, over MIDI is note on, note off. Uh, modulation, pitch. Uh, timing um, but you can send I mean there's 127 parameters that can go over that cable <coughs> can go over that data stream and those um, commands can be directed to whatever you like so you can have a MIDI controlled light rig for instance I can have um, a fader bank which is sending out MIDI controller numbers and I can have those mapped to different lights different colors different mixes um, or I can have them map to faders on a mixing desk, on a virtual mixing desk. I can have all of the parameters on here mapped to different parameters on this synthesizer. So MIDI is a control language and it's, it's focused particularly into the playing of musical electronic instruments. That's its purpose. There are other control languages for controlling other things like, you know, DMX, is it, for uh, light control um, and other protocols available. But for music production and bent to other things, that's what MIDI is for. So, note on, note off, controller changes, modulation, moving the filter. I can uh, take this knob here, I can move it and I can map it to something within the software. Can I do that right now to demonstrate it? I think that seems unlikely. Let's just have a look. So I haven't actually looked in here. MIDI learn. Let's turn that on. No. <laughs> uh, is that, that going to do anything about that? I'll do that. 
uh, I need to touch something so filter there we go so on that one do 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 but turn stop learning on there so if I put that back on so I've taken this knob here this one this this actual knob this is sending out MIDI information and I, uh, through the software it's going over the USB cable into the computer and I've told the software to listen for this MIDI control and it has uh, it's got a value of 27 that's its CC number its controller number and I've sent that to control the filter cutoff there can you see that moving up and down uh, am I in the way no let's bring that a little bit further up just in case and so when I play I am now controlling that software fader which is controlling the sound that I'm manipulating because MIDI is all about controlling lots of things from one other place so it came you know it arrived on the scene because you had people like Rick Wakeman with huge synthesizer racks all the way around them at a gig each one with a keyboard you know you know profit five your cs80s your memory mogs all the stuff was there and having to play each keyboard individually and so midi came about because people thought well that's stupid why do we have to do that why can't i have one keyboard and play all of these instruments and so midi came about to do that you had a single keyboard that had midi outputs you take that cable plug it into another device and I could play that synthesizer from this keyboard. That's where it came about. And it was only later that we realized that it was really easy to record that information into some kind of digital system, like a computer. Or you could use those controllers to change controllers within another device. That's what MIDI is about. It's about controlling this software synthesizer in this instance from this keyboard or recording or writing notes into a piece of software that I could then play through this software synthesizer or a different software synthesizer. Yeah, and I can control and record all sorts of movements to move everything within that synthesizer as if I had a thousand hands doing all the knob changes at once. And the, the point about MIDI and audio, which I explained earlier, I hope, is that with the, the MIDI stuff, because it's only MIDI that you're recording, you haven't committed it to tape. You haven't recorded the sound. So it doesn't matter what synthesizer you're using. So for instance, if I've got uh, three different synthesizers, I can record the key presses as MIDI into my door, plug it into one of these synthesizers and have it play those sounds. And you go, great, okay. But yeah, no, I don't like that. I can unplug it, plug it into the next synth and have that play the sound. I'm not having to re-record anything. I'm not having to do another performance. I've done the performance already and I'm now taking that performance and plugging it in to different sound sources. Yeah? That's what I can do with MIDI. Uh, another culture, another couture suggests that I should talk about MIDI channels. Sure, yeah, MIDI channels. There's 16 of them. 1 to 16. Each channel can run a whole MIDI thing all by itself. So once you have your bank of synthesizers, you can have each synthesizer on a different MIDI channel. And so you can address them very simply by changing uh, the MIDI channel on your MIDI controller. Because it's all computerized, it's all just data. And so it's very, very manipulable. Now we have MIDI 2.0 coming along very, 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 very slowly, which is going to kind of open it all up again to make it a higher resolution and more channels and more stuff going on. But ultimately, it's going to be the same deal as taking data from one place, sticking it into something else, which will then play a sound in response. <clears throat> You're welcome, mate.
uh, Lin Tao Man, Lin Tao Man, whatever you are, you're very welcome here. You don't have to know anything. If you've got beer, drink it. <laughs> um, just checking to see if I've missed anything else. Any other questions? I've written music all over my laptop. How do I make it play? Do I need a MIDI compatible marker pen? <laughs> uh, also, how should I clean the permanent marker pen? <laughs> That's hilarious. You should be on the telly. Um, will I need a splitter if my ancient 80s MIDI keyboards doesn't have a through? Oh, MIDI through. Now there's a question. Now MIDI through is now you know it's something about this which is which is interesting and I aim to do um, I aim to do some proper videos on this I think just to boil it down a bit because MIDI has become a thing again I thought we'd kind of got past it because the interesting thing about computers and MIDI is that it blurs the lines so much take that off because you don't really see the connection anymore. There used to be a time when you were trying to connect a keyboard to your computer. That was hard. You had to get the right interface. Um, you had to get things around the right way. It was very easy to reverse MIDI and have it backwards. Not that anything bad would happen, it just wouldn't work. And that would be immensely frustrating. Um, and you were always trying to connect numerous things to a computer and trying to get them all to work together. And then when everything went in the box and everything became software synthesizers, uh, VST instruments and things like that, we kind of got over the whole MIDI problems and everything just works nicely in the box. You don't need to worry about synchronization. You don't need to worry about cabling. It's all lovely software virtual stuff. Excellent. It all just comes out of a single output out of the back of your computer. Fantastic. Now, last couple of years, we've all got flipping synths sitting around and everything's gone all MIDI again. And we're all scratching our heads going, well, how do we make any of this work? <laughs> because it's quite an old technology. We've now got to think back and go, right, so MIDI, right. Um, is there such a thing as a MIDI interface? I don't even know if there is these days. I mean, I've, funnily enough, I've got in the back here somewhere, which I, I bet I'm not gonna be able to put my hands on now. I've got Oh, it doesn't matter. I'll give myself two more seconds to find it. <laughs> What's that? Oh. No, I'm never going to find it. I'd probably put it somewhere else. You know that thing where you're convinced you know where something is, and then you go to put your hand on it and it's just not there? I get that all the time. It's like a disease. Well, it's like a special gift I have. <laughs> no, I'm never going to find it. I've got an, an eMagic um, MT4, which is a, a MIDI interface, which is probably going to suddenly become useful again. There we go, there we go, I found it. There you go. Ah, oh, that's a piece of ancient technology, that is. So this is a MIDI interface. This is what we used to use back in the day to connect multiple devices to your computer. And it connected via USB, USB 1 most likely, and gave you four ports of MIDI out and two ports of MIDI in. Um, and that enabled you to connect to four different um, synthesizers directly. Because as your man says about MIDI through, uh, one of the things that they uh, invented at one point, can't remember why or how, is, is to enable you to control more than one thing at a time. They, gener they created this through technology, which would essentially squirt whatever came into the synthesizer back out again of the through. And that meant that you could chain up synthesizers and sound making boxes um, using cables and using a single, com a single controller keyboard that had one MIDI out, which would go into one device, then through to the next one, through to the next one. And you could play them all at once. If you could set the individual synthesizers to their own MIDI channel, then you could access everything from a single keyboard and either play them together or separately. But you would need to create that chain of devices in order to do that, because you commonly only had one MIDI output out of your keyboard. So what was the question again? Can't really remember. 
other than how do we do it if you don't have a through? Well, now I've got another piece of gear here that, <coughs> that you could use, which is, is this, is this the job? <laughs> I think so. Something like this. See, this is a much more recent device. This is from RK um, Retro Kits. And it's essentially a MIDI through box. You put MIDI into one of the inputs and it all comes out of the other one. And it enables me to, uh, you to connect it via USB, to sit that down, connect a whole bunch of little synths and play them all from one keyboard. That's precisely what that is doing. So yeah, that's a, it's what would be called a MIDI through box. A MIDI splitter, is that the same thing? I suppose. Is that the same thing as a MIDI through box? Are they the same? Could be. But yeah, that's the sort of thing that you're going to need. If you don't have through, you need to split the MIDI single MIDI signal or copy the MIDI signal, you know, to the various destinations that you want. And so we are running to the, into those problems again now. And so we'll be able to get something like a MIDI interface for a computer that has multiple outputs is becoming more and more important. Although USB is sort of also doing that as well, because many new synths these days also have a USB port. And so you might be better off getting a powered USB hub and using that. Although again, you although you become dependent on your computer being able to run all of that. Whereas something like this, I can just plug one keyboard in and have eight other devices connected to it without any computer whatsoever. So that's interesting. This, I don't think works anymore. I don't think there are any drivers for it. So if somebody wants to make me an offer on a classic piece of eMagic equipment, then um, by all means get in touch. <laughs> <clears throat> but um, RK make a lot of good stuff. So does uh, Kenton. Kenton is a good place for MIDI. So Um, Sir Big Head, are you asking about my setup here at the moment? This is a Surface Pro 7 running Windows 10. This is a Motu M4 audio interface. It has four inputs and four outputs. Simple, good, cheap, made of metal, works brilliantly. Great monitoring on the front. Um, this is an Ovation Launch Key Mini. It's just a little mini controller. It's got some special functionality with Ableton Live that I never ever use. Has a great arpeggiator. Oh, I broke it. That's a shame. Oh, there we go. Which I really like. Because it has mutate and deviate. Which are not currently working. There you go. Mutate is a little knob that I can turn. Which has an effect on the arpeggiator and pushes it into different places. Either gates or melody. No sound is coming out of this. If you weren't here earlier, you would have missed all of this. This is just a MIDI keyboard. The sound is coming out of a piece of software which is running on the computer. And the physical sound is coming out of the back of the audio interface. Oh, oh, easy now, easy. Uh, can we see that? Let's see, we've got lights on the front. Cable's coming out the back. That's how everything is working in this particular instance. <laughs> Can't see the commentary. I don't want to explain mini channels. I think I kind of covered that. Uh, Benjamin Barry says, "What is the best door to get a song finished as soon as possible? All sounds and everything else simple and not too many." 
<laughs> well, it depends on how complex your song is, and then it doesn't really matter. Um, I mean, all doors have their strengths and weaknesses. If you want something, um, I mean, Zen Beats is a great place to, to to start because it's very easy to build up loops. You can base everything on a, a loop-based way of recording. Um, and then put those together and mix it down very simply. If you want something which is going to take you all the way through to the mastering process, then Studio One is probably the best at doing that. Um, other doors that, that enable you to create music easily, I'd look at Reason. Reason Studio is, is awesome for that because it has a whole bunch of synthesizers and loops and drum machines built in so you can just play without having to get anything extra. Um, but you know it comes down to you man I mean you can you can produce an album of just vocals and guitar on your computer in any piece of software you could use Microsoft sound recorder for that no you probably couldn't but you know it's kind of a how how long is a piece of string type question because it depends on so much stuff if you want to if the music that you're trying to make to finish a song requires uh, the London Philharmonic Orchestra then that may take a little bit more time you're going to need lots of audio inputs into your computer and so the, the setup for that might require something slightly different if you're recording a band you might just be able to put two microphones together as a stereo pair within the space and record that it might be all electronic music in which case try out FL Studio something like that might be awesome so it really does depend. It really does depend. The important thing is to give something a go and expect to have to, to do some learning and to take some time and to see where it takes you. But if you didn't see the rest of this live stream, then, then go back and have another look later on and have a look at how easy it was to make a little bit of music in Zen Beats. You know? And you can do that in any door. I could, I could do the same demo, pretty much, in any door. I'm not going to because I can't remember how. But I could very simply just plug in a guitar, write a drum track, write a little bass track, off you go. Off you go. Don't be scared. What's my favourite MIDI channel? Nine. Yeah, somebody talking about MIDI merging. That's where you're trying to bring a number of controllers down to a single place. Yeah, that can be troublesome. Um, but less, it's not something that people do that often, generally. And certainly if you're using USB on a computer, then it's, it's kind of done automatically. You don't have to worry about it quite so much because you can map anything to anything and all of your software instruments can take multiple MIDI inputs, normally. So it's not such a, not such a thing. But um, for people who need to do that and want to do that, that's best they go and find out how, I would say. See, multiple clocks running, multiple devices, it all gets, yeah, it does, can get very complex. Um, <laughs> but there's never been an answer to that. There's never been an answer to having a lot of different machines running at different times i think one of the things that one of the the downsides of the hardware boom at the moment is that we're coming at it from the experience of software and the software hardware worlds in this respect are very very different and computers have lulled us into this sense that synchronization is easy everything just works together everything is within the same place but once you start taking machines outside of that environment, it's actually really difficult and always has been. And actually, we've got around it mostly because it's not as important as you think. You know, you can run machines together with tap tempo. You can run machines together by ear. You know, you can put your finger on the tape as it turns around to slow it down a little bit. You can restart things in order to bring them back into loop again. You know, what we have to understand with hardware devices <clears throat> is that you have to think on your feet a bit more you have to little be a bit more out of the box and there's also some things that are just not going to work so you might have to play them manually you might have to get a band member in <laughs> you know 
I don't see why we should expect all of our digital and analog machines just to run happily together because it used to kind of work on your computer. See, that's that's not really how how it works, either in sort of physics or magic, depending on which way you look at it. You know, I mean, I remember when I was building PCs early on that you were trying to sync to tape. You were trying to use SMPTE on Pro Tools, on your computer, on Cubase, at the same time as running all the audio on two inch tape. You know, that was difficult <laughs> and it was never perfect. The whole point was that you had to have an audio interface which could uh, vary its sample rate in real time, which I don't think anybody ever talks about these days because it's not the sort of thing that you do. Uh, but you have to vary sample rate in real time in order to keep up with the imperfections of the timing coming off the tape because the timing coming off tape, simply timing, analog timing, is not perfect, you know? And yet, all our favorite albums were done in this way. And yet we seem to expect perfection in timing and synchronization. And it doesn't have to be the case. In fact, I would suggest that pers the pursuit of perfect synchronization is not really gonna get you anywhere. All it's gonna do is prevent you from making music. And if you can't get a couple of things to sync, do something else. Use a different machine, use one machine. Use another one alongside on tap tempo. Use multiple clocks, you know. <laughs> Don't be so bloody perfect all the time. So yeah, MIDI merge, if someone hasn't already answered that in the chat, <clears throat> is simply that you have perhaps two MIDI keyboards that you want to send into a single device, which is more likely you're going to have a MIDI keyboard and some other form of controller, a fader controller, a knob controller, and you want both of those things, the information from them, to merge together to control a single device. That's the idea. That's the idea. Oops. Uh, to get Zen Beats onto your PC, if you've got it on the iPad, is you just need to install install the demo, um, log in using the same login as you do on your iPad, and go for my stuff, and it will install everything that's installed on your other thing. I mean, um, Zen Beats and Stagelight have always had this weird login system where if you accidentally put in the wrong email address, it automatically <laughs> creates a whole new account for you. So you're sitting there uh, looking at it going, why isn't all my stuff here? And it's because you've logged in under a different name, even though it didn't say, this isn't your name. It just automatically creates an account, which has driven me nuts in the past. Has I met, have I mentioned CC numbers? Well, kind of in passing, but it's all getting a little bit too complicated. I mean, I did a whole thing here, look, where I mapped uh, this knob to that. Are you watching, seeing that? Yes, you are. Um, which is done via controller numbers because yeah, MIDI is all about um, 127 values, 128 values, naught to 127. So, um, that covers eight octaves of the keyboard, that covers the, the sweep of modulation, that, that covers um, any kind of control that you want to apply to a fader. Everything has essentially 128 values. And that's generally enough. That's generally enough for us to hear, to not really hear any stepping or any problems of resolution. That seems to do it. 
And so there's 127 different things you can do over MIDI. And those are generally called controller numbers, CC numbers, that are mapped, that can be mapped. By mapped, we mean sent to control a particular thing. So this here was control number 22 that was sending out. So that sends out a control data on number 22. This is picking that up. That's assigned to 22. And I'm now able to move that between 0 and 127 values. That's, that's how the control system works. It's simple. It's elegant. It's been working for years and years and years. <clears throat> Uh, how about mixing both software and hardware world? Looks like in these days it's been tried, it's been a trend to separate this, but I kind of mix both worlds. And Drake, you're Mr. Cobol. Yes, indeed, I will be doing something on this on Wednesday night, mixing these worlds, exactly that. I've done other videos on it, you might want to go and seek those out. A year or two ago I did a, a, a bunch on Bitwig and Ableton Live using the CV tools, using Silent Way and using the stuff inside Bitwig for connecting these two worlds together. I'm going to do a bit more of that on Wednesday. The main purpose is to look at Bitwig, because Bitwig's got some really interesting stuff in it that I haven't looked at in a good while, and I'm going to use the facilities within it to pull stuff into hardware via both control voltage and via MIDI. So how am I going to do this via MIDI? I don't think I have a MIDI to CV converter. I've got a CV to MIDI, funnily enough, which I will use to go one way, but going the other. Interesting. We'll talk about these sorts of things on Wednesday. I might have to pick myself up. I do have the Her mod, which will do that. I wonder if there's a simpler way. I might have to find a simpler way of doing that. Ah, oh, yeah. I know I've got a little bit of that MIDI to CV within the Nifty case, haven't I? Maybe I'll use that. It's just not very obvious. A module is nice and obvious. Anyway, I'm going to have to think about that. It's not something for you to think about. So yes, I will absolutely do how do you connect your computer to modular and other synths. I'll do that on Wednesday night. That's going to be the focus for Wednesday night. It's going to be Bitwig because that's interesting. And how do you connect that to hardware synths, modular, control voltage, MIDI? Because those are two completely different um, methods of connecting stuff together. Whoa. Because everything's about CV these days. Or is it? Or is it about MIDI? Oh no, is it USB? Oh, is it MIDI 2? Oh, I don't know. See? Lots of stuff. Lots of confusion. So Wednesday night, we'll have a look at this in as much detail as we can bear in trying to get these worlds to talk to each other to try to unpack and explain how that, how that can work. Can that work? I think it can. So yeah, let's do that. Wednesday night. Cool. Try what out? <laughs> no, I haven't seen anything MIDI 2.0. I even spoke to uh, Roger Lynn about it a couple of weeks ago. Um, and he doesn't really have any interest in MIDI 2.0 at all. He doesn't really see the point. And I would wholeheartedly agree with him. I don't really see the point either. Um, I think, again, it's a reaction to being spoiled on the computer because the computer kind of does all of those things. It does MIDI 2.0 sort of already because you already get lists of presets, you already get controllers mapped, you already get all that stuff going on. It would be great to have MIDI 2.0. It's just I don't know whether we can be bothered. I don't know that it's going to greatly improve the way we do things particularly. It will just be, oh yeah, that's handy kind of thing. That's my feeling on it right now. What time on Wednesday? Oh, I'm going to go for 8 o'clock again. That's all right. 8 o'clock GMT. So whatever 
crazy place in the world that you live that will that will obviously you have to you have to work that out <laughs> <clears throat> right i think because we've gone through a couple of hours now i think that's probably enough i think that's probably enough i mean thanks for spending time with me i hope that was useful uh, it wasn't perhaps as polished i would have liked to have made it but um we certainly had a good go at getting that sort of information across what i will attempt to do uh as i'm as i'm trying to commit to a bit of focus on uh, computer-based stuff is I'm, I might try to do a, a, a properly filmed video about it an introduction to computer music because in fact I do have footage of this seminar that I did back in I think it was I think it was um, I think it was nine, 1999 <laughs> uh, I did a series of seminars at turnkey on introduction to computer music and um, it's essentially the same thing, saying the same thing uh, that we did 30 years ago, 20 years ago. It's, um, it's interesting. It's interesting. So, yeah, it's definitely worth doing again so that I can properly formulate my thoughts together and try to make it as clear and concise as possible. But I hope my ramblings and my demonstrations were somehow useful in putting together some of these ideas. And as I say, I'm here all week and there'll be opportunities to talk more about uh, this sort of thing if you've got burning questions that should come up tomorrow night as I say I'm talking to Pete Brown from Microsoft we're going to talk about Windows drivers protocols how Windows works Bluetooth MIDI probably Thunderbolt things like that oh yes all the interesting things about Windows that we don't, can't quite work out and try to to sort out stuff <laughs> so that's tomorrow night eight o'clock uh, here again uh, Tuesday night, talking to Personas about Studio One and audio interfaces. Wednesday night is going to be Bitwig and Connections to Stuff Night. Thursday afternoon, me and Milo Melodies are going to have a chat about hardware and software and contrasting the two, how well they work or don't work, what's best, that kind of thing. The great debate. And then Friday night, it's all about Windows tweaks. I appreciate also that it's Thanksgiving over in the States this sort of week which means you might not be able to make everything. But hey, it's all going to be on YouTube for viewing at another point. So don't you worry about that. And next week also should be Multi Music Monthly Week, followed up by we'll have a live stream this time next Sunday. All right, does that all sound good? Any last burning questions? Uh, what kind of camera? I've just upgraded my overhead camera. I, it's been driving me nuts. I've um, so got a lovely GH5 for this camera, which is just a beautiful thing most of the time other than the mat getting the manual focus right and i'm not quite sure why my face is quite so glowy tonight either anyway but the overhead i've just got hold of it it's a um <laughs> uh it's a sony <laughs> it's not written on it somewhere it should be written on it what have I thought oh here we go um it's a sony handycam does that help? Don't know that that helps. Uh, it's essentially a camcorder because the problem that you find with um, wonderful um, SLR cameras is that they don't stay on long enough. They turn themselves off all the time when you're recording, and that just does my head in. So the whole one of the reasons I went for the GH5 is precisely because it doesn't do that. You can record and film for as long as you like which is brilliant but with camcorders they film for as long as you like as well and so for the overhead one because I'm not quite so fussed in using it as a camera camera I just want something straightforward going down then this has been an upgrade on a camcorder I've been running for about 10-15 years so it's I'm very very happy with the picture quality and how that's going and I seem to have I hope on screen that doesn't look too bad I think Go on with it anyway. Maniel, thank you. Thank you. That's very kind.
Thank you. Big wig. Yeah, and that wasn't that um, Warship Down. <laughs> uh, so cool. Should I do the Stranger Things again thing again? That's not it. Enjoying these synths from Cherry Audio, they're quite, quite fantastic. Uh, the 106, and they also did a 2600. Fantastic! I would recommend checking them out. They're only 25 dollars each, I think. Brilliant! Just totally, totally great. Thanks for joining me. I've been Robin Vincent. This is the Multi Music Technology Channel. All week, Computer Music Week. Do check out the channel to see what else is happening this week and come and join us for a bit more stuff. Otherwise, we're all about synthesizers and modular hardware, software, audio interfaces, bits and pieces. I've got reviews coming up. You might have seen my recent one of the Korg sequence of the SQ64. I've got, no, it's not there, it's over here, the black sequencer. From Erica Synths to do. I know Luke Pop has done it. I know he has. He did the Korg one as well. I think I can offer a different approach. I think what Luke Pop does is fantastic. But if you want a slightly more crazed, um, emotional, and unhinged uh, review of something, then uh, then I'm your man. I'm definitely your man on that. But I'm not going to be doing the Black Sequencer review straight away because it, it needs a bit more time. I need more time with it. Uh, the firmware, I mean, Luke Pop evidently did his review on an earlier firmware, um, but the, the latest firmware, firmware only arrived on the day of release. And so I kind of wanted to hang off getting too deep into it until it was actually finished. And then I'm going to spend a bit of time with it and then I'll do a nice review on it. Um, so that's good. I've got loads more stuff coming along to do reviews and demonstrations on so do stay tuned there's tons of stuff happening on this channel and we'll continue to do so so that'll do shutters what no it's nothing to do with the size of your SD card it's to do with it's to do with, uh, I mean, maybe you're in America, I don't know, but in Europe, um, you can't, if you, uh, you're, if you have a digital camera, <laughs> sorry, let me get my words around the right way, uh, digital cameras um, have a different uh, tax situation uh, if they have, a, if they become video cameras. So if you've got a stills camera, like a, an SLR camera, like the GH5, for instance, I used to have a Canon um, EOS 70, uh, and it would only record for half an hour. That's a maximum that it would do, because if it did anything over that, it'd be classed as a video camera and would require extra classification and extra tax. And so SLR cameras tend to be artificially restricted to recording half an hour which is, it would just, just be the worst thing in the world because you would never notice that the camera had turned itself off until it kind of clicks into standby mode, which would always be two minutes after it had stopped recording. It was the worst, just the worst thing in the world. 
Um, so, but the Lumix, the GH5, it has that facility. They've decided just to embrace the idea that it's also a camcorder, also a video recording machine, and that's brilliant. I wish other cameras would do the same. Nothing to do with the SD card. It's to do, I mean, apparently technology-wise, it's to do with holding that, uh, the sensor open and the, the, the cooling that's required for that. There are other sort of technological reasons as well, but mostly it's a tax thing, tax and classification thing. What a pain that is. What a pain that is. Um, uh, Keith in Watford no you don't have to go and make new tunes but I think it's important probably that you do what I'm going to go is going to go and watch some telly in bed I think and finish my beer so cool thanks for taking around I don't mean to keep taking any more questions otherwise we'll be here forever yeah I mean Jim get the, the Lumix GX5 is the one is the one to get all the GX4, GH4 also uh, those ones don't have restrictions, but absolutely, if you're going to choose a DLSR camera, check for how long the recording time is uh, for shooting video. Do absolutely check. Any suggestions for beginners? I, the suggestion is to rewind to the front of this live stream and start again and take a look at Zen Beats. It's the best way in. And I'll do a review of Zen Beats 2 soon. Right, okay, that's it, I'm going now. So thanks very much, it's really appreciated. And in the meantime, go and make some tunes.